Welcome everybody to the Top Rope Podcast. Yeah, what do we want to talk about? This is AEW Revolution Recap. Let's get right into it and in talking about Sting's last match. Oh my goodness. I knew when you heard in those promos, Sting was going to leave it all out there. You know, a lot of guys say that and they go out and have good matches. But Sting went out there and he did. He did some crazy, crazy stuff. Him and Darby both making sure this would be a night that wrestling fans will remember for a long time. And I think it's the best pay-per-view of the year so far. Didn't start out that way. It was all right. But, man, it got better and better as the night went along. And just with it being Sting's last match and as great as that was and all the different spots that they did, sometimes that stuff's not always exactly my favorite, all the blood and all the crazy, crazy stuff. You know, if they haven't told me a good story up until that point and it's just a bunch of moves and I don't care, but I cared here, guys. And I think... Pretty much everybody cared with it being Sting's last match. I thought I would shed a few more tears, but um, I don't know. I just I, I was just kind of soaking it in. I was soaking it in. It was kind of wasn't really setting in to, that this was his last match. As he's coming down the ring, and you know, I was getting a little bit emotional showing the uh, backstage in uh, the promo where Sting's in the theater. You know, Showtime. One last time, let's do this. You know, seeing some of those old pictures. I think if they would have been able to use the WWE footage from WCW, that would have helped. I know WWE didn't want them to, and I understand that was their footage. I get that, but I could have lent them a few clips, right? AEW's did them a few favors whenever they had Jericho and uh, another wrestler or two uh, say something for John Cena's 20th anniversary. They could have lent them just a couple of clips. You know, did right by Sting, but they didn't. But that's okay. Um, that was I was I was feeling it then. I was feeling it then. And uh, but then whenever the interest hits, I was just like I don't know. I was soaking it all in, and it, maybe it wasn't setting in. I tell you when it set in was a little bit later on during that match. Whenever all that crazy stuff happens, Sting looks like he can't go no more. He's in the corner. Here comes the nature boy, Ric Flair. And whenever Ric Flair was laying on top of him, and, you know, telling the young bus to get back and no and no, you know, oh man, that just it, it brought me back to Flair's last match with Shawn Michaels saying "I love you." I mean, that was great. And the young bucks in this match saying, "We don't love you, we hate you." Before they give Sting that super kick, and then he's oh, and his head goes back. Great camera work, by the way. His head goes back, and then it's come when he comes forward, those eyes. <laughs> and then I mean, oh, and no selling the uh, power bomb through the table off the ladder, and obviously selling and registering, registering and selling are huge parts of wrestling. But there's a few people that are allowed to do that. The Undertaker, PCO, you know, Sting, a few other guys that are these otherworldly characters you know so it makes logical sense whenever they do it um you know and then do it sparingly and it's just it, oh, it was so good it was so good i was jumping up and down so many different times uh you know i really thought sting i i, I man as much as as much as i was wanting him to win i was thinking there's a definitely a good chance that he was going to go out on his back like a lot of them do but i think that by Sting and Darby winning this match, number one, Sting finishing undefeated in AEW, that'll be something I don't think we're going to forget. If he puts that, if he gets that one loss, you know, maybe I mean we're going to remember which loss it was. But I think going undefeated in AEW, awesome. Them finally winning the belt and then Sting going out a champion. Oh man, it was it was just so great. And what he did. You know, you could have said, oh, he goes out on his back, you know, helps put the young bucks over, helps even build them up even more in this great heel run that they've been on. But I think by going out on top, he put his tag team partner, Darby Allen, over. And Darby, to me, 
Hopefully going forward, they can book him properly. They don't always do a great job of, of booking at times, but they sure did They sure did book Sting properly. And I hope Darby can move forward and, and, and really take this. Maybe he gets a new tag team partner. He's got to go out and find one. Can we bring in somebody for Darby that's, you know, not, not probably not going to be as big as Sting, but somebody, you know, amazing and that would make sense and that we could pop really loud for. Somebody that we haven't seen in forever or at all on, on uh, AEW, maybe. Uh, or you could have Darby forfeit over the belts. I don't know if we see Sting uh, on this Dynamite handing over the belts and, and giving a uh, farewell speech. I mean, he kind of already did that after the pay-per-view, but I think we could see him come out. Darby come out at least and possibly fork over the belt and then there'll be a, a tag team tournament and Darby maybe goes on, goes out and goes on a singles run. Roddy's the champion now, the international championship. You know, he could go up against Roddy uh, for, that, for that belt, but Roddy's probably going to keep that for a while. So I don't know on a singles run for Darby who he could go after. But uh, yeah, I thought Sting put him over. Like I said, man, I did. I shed a tear whenever Flair was on top of Sting, and uh, yeah, just so good. I don't know if we, I don't know if we needed Steamboat. He hadn't been part of the story up until that point, but it was fine. I have no problems with it. One of the coolest things was Sting's sons coming out in, you know, Surfer Sting, and then the NWO Wolfpack Sting, and then them helping helping them out made sense because they got beat down by the young bucks i don't know where they went to after the first initial uh, early on uh, set and spots of that match where they got involved and then sting goes back takes <laughs> takes the spot off of the stage oh man oh man and then definitely my move of the night top move of the night darby off the ladders through the glass, on through the chairs, on through the glass, and just his back bleeding all. Oh my goodness! Like that, that's real. That's real. That's not Dax going over in the corner and blading himself and then bleeding out, and the announcers don't even know why he was bleeding. Oh, he hit the ring post. Oh, he might have hit the stairs. He's bleeding everywhere. No, Darby's blood was real, and you, I mean, I know Dax's was real too, but Darby's blood was natural. I mean, you can't fake that. And that was just unbelievable. Glad he's all right. Some of the stuff he said afterwards in the farewell speech, like, I'm going to go to the hospital now. And Sting's like, oh, text me how many stitches you get. <laughs> oh, man, such good stuff from, from everything to do with Sting's last match. I, I give it an A+. Plus. I give it an A+, plus for sure. But at the same time, man, it does suck, too. I know he's 64, and he gave us all these years, but... I just, you know, maybe that's why whenever he's coming out, you know, I'm not really shedding a tear because I don't want to believe it. I don't want to believe that it's the end. I don't, you know. And, you know, I, I don't know. Hopefully he sticks around maybe, you know, here and there. We don't need to see him every week now, but, you know, he might be doing some legend stuff or, I don't know, he joked about going to commentary. I don't, I don't necessarily... Need to see that, but it might not be bad if he does something with that. But it's uh, going to miss him, man. Going to miss the Stinger. I mean, he's right up there, very close to, to my Mount Rushmore. It's, it's, you know, all those years that he gave us. And th through my formulaic years growing up, everything he did. And coming out of the rafters all those years. And then one more time on Dynamite and just this whole... This whole deal, so, so very special and definitely will be one that I don't forget for a long, long time. God bless you, Sting. That's my initial thoughts. It's a long night, long night of wrestling and celebrating Stinger going out on top, baby. Showtime is over. Getting into the rest of the pay-per-view, working our way backwards on the card. We have the AEW World Championship, Samoa Joe, Hangman Adam Page, whose house Swerve Strickland in the co-main event. 
And this one was pretty good. What did we learn out of this? Number one, that Hangman has gone full heel. The heel turn completed in this match. And he was being booked that way, leading up. Everybody loves Swerve. Hangman is his greatest enemy. So they've had some good matches. Hangman's transitioning, transitioning, transitioning. Crowd knew that. They were booing Hangman pretty loud right out of the gate, but the heel transformation is complete with Hangman taking out two refs in this matchup. First one, he didn't get him in time, so there had to be a kick out, you know, and then he yanks him out of the ring, so kind of botched that a little bit. Second one was better, and then, you know, Hangman using the, the belt, I believe it was, taking those guys out. Full heel, and, and that's good. That's good. I, I like Hangman as this Magnum TA type heel with the uh, mustache. Uh, I think it's good booking. I think we prove now that Samoa Joe is not a transitional champion. Uh, if, he, if he would have been four or five, six months into this reign, I think they give it to Swerve. But the fact that he's only two months into this reign, they, ha they had to have him keep the belt so he could prove he's not a transitional champion. That's what he did, and like I said before, I think he keeps that belt for one reason. And so he can lose that belt to Samoa Joe. Or Samoa Joe can lose that belt to Ward Low, I should say. Omit! Ward Low wins his eight-man scramble match. We're going to get into that, I think. That's one of the reasons why Joe retained. This was a good, solid match. Crowd was popping really hard for it. Really wanting Swerve to win. So did I. I was rooting and rooting, rooting for Swerve. I'm going to give this match a B plus. It was in A, A minus territory, territory for me until we heard him on commentary talking about you know, why did Hangman tap out? Oh, so maybe to prevent, because he hates Swerve so much that he didn't want Swerve to win the title because Swerve was like right behind Joe, maybe getting ready to do a move. But number one, how does Hangman know Swerve's back there? And number two, no. You can have all the hatred you want. Whenever it comes down to that championship, that is number one. That's the first and foremost thing that you need to be concerned about. Not worrying about letting the other guy... Well, you lost yourself if you're tapping out just so you don't want Swerve to win. It just didn't make any sense to me. I hope it was... I, I don't know. I hope that wasn't a planted thing that commentary said and it was just a screw-up. One of the guys just thinking for themselves and throwing that out there. I don't remember who it was, but throwing that out there. Hopefully that wasn't planned. Hopefully they don't do anything with that storyline going forward because it's trash. El Toilete de Agua. And that hurt it from being an A, but I'm giving a B plus. Pretty solid stuff there going on in that triple threat match for the AEW World Championship. And Swerve now, you know, taking that loss, like I said, you know, now, if, if they are going to do that stuff with what commentary is saying, are we going to get a Swerve Hangman 3, I believe it would be? I mean, I'm okay with that, but th that needs to be the last of it. And what do we do with Swerve now? Does he figure out to work his way back to actually get a one-on-one -on -one match with Samoa Joe? Does he win it then? Like I said, does Wardlow pop in there, get a match, maybe beat Joe? For the world championship, uh, you know, I would argue that Wardlow does need to, to win it if he's going to have any type of run and be anything in AEW after the inconsistent booking. I just don't know. Maybe AEW thought he wasn't that great on the mic, and that's why they've been inconsistent booking him. You know, he gives some really solid heart-to-heart -heart promos, but whenever he has to go off of a script or, you know, has to go off a wrestling line story-wise promos... That's just pure wrestling storyline and not real stuff. I think he struggles at time. I think that may be the reason why they haven't really pushed him to the moon. But now, I and mean, this is his last chance for me, and that was the right call, having him win that scramble. Um, but, but, but are they going to be able to build him up? Have they done too much damage already to him that it wouldn't be the right thing to do now? The right call to put him as the champion? 
I don't know, man. I, I tell you who <laughs> who should be the champion probably sooner than later is Will freaking Osprey. He's the best rope to rope wrestler in the world. Argue differently. And he's getting a lot better on the mic. And I'm jumping all over the place here, but I'm super excited. It was a great pay-per-view. No, I'm not an AEW, Mark. I love it all. I love WWE, AEW. When I think it's good, I'm going to tell you that. Whether what company, No matter what company it is, when it's bad, I'm going to tell you that. No matter what company it is. I don't hold any bias. I don't know this whole war thing, WWE versus AEW, garbage. I don't need it. If you don't like another company, that's fine. Cool. Just like the other company. Uh, rant aside, where were we? We're on the AEW World Championship and giving that one a B plus. And I think Swerve would be okay after this. I think they're gonna continue to find a way. He might try, he might cool off just a little bit, but and you know, did and they could argue, did they miss their chance now? Was this a chance? He's so hot. Needed to put the belt on him. He's so hot. Well, guys like Cody Rhodes have proven that you can stay hot for a long, long time and work your way back. No matter how long it takes, work your way back to that championship. I think Swerve can do it. I do. Moving on. All right, we continue to work our way backwards on the card. And next up, we have a match of the year candidate. And it is my match of the night. Will Ospreay and Takesta. I'm going to have it tie with Sting and Darby versus the Young Bucks for match of the night. Just because of that storyline with Sting and Darby. But from a in-ring rope to rope, this could be the match of the year. Will Ospreay is the best wrestler in the world. Rope to rope. There's no doubt in my mind. Like I said, argue me differently in the comments. This was an A+. A home run. They knocked it out of the park, guys. They, they absolutely did. And here's why. Here's the difference between a Will Ospreay, high-flying, doing crazy type of moves, stuff that, you know, we hardly ever see or we've never seen before. Here's why whenever he does that, it makes sense versus whenever you got a bunch of guys in masks, dumping around, diving around, uh, other guys, just other high-flyers, I'm not trying to single out the masked luchador wrestlers, but we see a lot of them doing the high flying stuff, right? So, but when Will Ospreay does it versus almost anybody else, he still sells the moves. And probably more importantly, he registers the move. Now, what's the difference between registering and selling? Registering is right on the initial contact of the move. What are you doing in those next two, three seconds? Maybe even only a second sometimes. What's your face say in that second right after you get hit? And just for that tiny bit of period. Now, once that two, three seconds is over, then it becomes selling the move. If Because a lot of times, if you are doing these quick, crazy move from move to move to move to move, you don't have time to sell. But you do have time to register the move before you go into the next move. And Will Ospreay does that so, so very well. And then he'll be down for a little bit. Selling a crazy big move. And then he's up doing another crazy big move. But they don't just jump from one move to the other without even letting you know that the other move happened. A lot of time, these other guys just waste moves just for the sake of doing them. For the sake of the shot factor and the wow factor. And then two seconds later, they're doing something else crazy. And you already forgot about the other thing they did. You know, yeah, it's exciting and you're seeing all this stuff. But at the end of the day, I mean, are you going to be able to remember it? You, you might remember, yeah, I remember they did it. That was a good match. They did a lot of crazy stuff, but did they make you care? Will Ospreay, by God, 
makes me care. And he's getting so much better on the mic. And he, well, I don't think he was that bad before, but I, I think his in-ring was an A+. Plus. I would have said his mic game is at, maybe, is at maybe a B. I think now that's up to a B plus. I think he can get it to an A minus A. And I think he can be the world champion someday. Maybe sooner than later. I think he's that good. And Takesta, I'll tell you when I was sold on Takesta was the moment that JR called him the Japanese Randy Orton. That was way, way back when Takesta's just first around. And JR said that, I'm like, oh, Japanese Randy Orton. And I watched, you know, I think he'd had maybe a match or two by that point, and I was thinking he was pretty good. Um, but whenever JR said that, I was like, wow, I need to pay attention to this guy. And he is damn good. And he is the Japanese Randy Orton. I love him. He's very solid. Obviously, you know, he's not going to be able to speak English, so he needs Don Callis, and that's fine. You can overcome not being very good on the mic if you got. A really solid manager, and Don Callis is one of the best. He's one of the best heels. It's interesting, this dynamic. Now we're going to see it again. We're going to see it again with uh, Will Ospreay and Kyle Fletcher. Kyle Fletcher comes out after Will Ospreay finishes off to Kesto, wins that match of the year candidate match. Kyle Fletcher comes out. It's going to be another hell of a match on Dynamite, and it's interesting. Uh, before, I was like, why you got... Why you got family members fighting each other, especially heel family members, doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Well, I don't know. Cows are starting to make me believe. Commentary is starting to make me believe. I don't think it's going to go on for too much longer without there being a split up. And what if they do come out and they are stronger at the end of the day and they rise in the factions rankings? I'm going to unveil those a little bit later on here in the Top Rope Podcast. But yeah, match of the night. Time for match of the night. Will Ospreay and Takesta getting an A plus in my book. And now, who, who do you want to see? I know he's fighting, fighting Fletcher on Dynamite, but what's some other good potential matchups for Will Bogdan Ospreay? Him and Swerve would be phenomenal. Him and Darby would be phenomenal. He's already fought, I know he fought Jericho. I think he might have fought one or two other guys so far, you know, when he wasn't officially signed with AEW, but who do you guys think? Let me know. I just a couple guys that came off the top of my head whenever I was thinking about it last night of who Will Ospreay should fight next for his next big feud, is it? Do they continue on with this storyline? They break up? Maybe he fights Hobbs. Maybe he fights everybody in the family. But I think eventually they're going to have bigger plans for him, and I can't wait. I love Will Ospreay. He's in my top ten. You're going to see that coming up. We're moving on, though. And before that, it was a really tough spot on the card for Tony Storm defending her... Timeless Tony Storm, excuse me. Defending her... AEW Women's World Championship against Diana Parazo. Zo, Zo, Parazo. I always say Paraza. Parazo. And she's my girl. I should know how to say her name, but I don't sometimes. Uh, thought it was great storytelling, you know, with Diana Parazo saying she wanted to see the old Tony Storm. That's who she wanted to face at Revolution. And then it's Mariah May coming out in that old Tony Storm gear. Oh, they looked a lot alike at first. I was like, wait, wait, is that her? No, no, that's Mariah May. Well, it took me about a second or two. I was like, no, that's Mariah May. Perfect, great. And then Timeless Tony Storm comes out. And they put on a decent little match. Tell us a good story. It wasn't fantastic, but it was totally acceptable. Like I said, tough spot on the card. Um, you know, it was another interference finish, so... Maybe, you know, there was two or three of them, I think, on the show. There had already been one or two by this point. So, didn't really, didn't really like that, but I get it. Totally get it with having that happen. And, you know, with Tony Storm being the bad girl. But this was fine. I give it a C plus. Uh, still very much interested in Tony Storm. Who's her next challenger? Does Perrazzo 
try to get another shot and have it be a, a fair fight. You know, does Tony Storm make her go through Mariah May to get it? You know, or maybe a handicap match or something. I don't, I don't know. I'm just throwing stuff out here. Or do you totally move on from Perazzo? And then what do you do with Perazzo after this? I mean, does she just fall right back down to the wayside and you don't have anything for her? I hope not. I think she's really solid. I know she gets criticized for her look sometimes, which is, you know, whatever. Like, I, I get it. I get it. You know, look is a part of wrestling. But at the same time, you know, I, I, like her, her physique doesn't bother me. It's like she looks like a star to me. She's got great ring gear. She's pretty solid. They're both pretty decent in the ring. Um, and this was fine. And we'll see what they do moving moving forward with both those gals. And ooh, big business coming up. Spoiler alert, possibly. I know I've been hearing a lot of rumors. And gosh, I hate him. I like to stick with kayfabe. I wish I wouldn't have been reading some of the stuff I was reading. But spoiler alert. It looks like we are going to get Mercedes Monet at Big Business in Boston. I believe. I think that's this coming Wednesday. On Dynamite, yeah. The week after at the most. So I really think it's this coming week. So, do you throw Mercedes Monet right into that picture against Tony Storm? Yeah, you have to. I mean, they're going to need... They need to bring back, like, Britt Baker and Jamie Hayter. And they need some more star power in this women's division. Otherwise, a, a chick like, like Mercedes Monet... Oh, Sasha Banks... Just run over them all, man. That'd be some good stuff with her and Tony Storm. You know, I, I just don't see them bringing her in and her being able, I don't know, who else is she going to go against, you know? You got Stokely Hathaway managing Chris Statlander and Willow, and I, I don't even care. I mean, it's, it's, Hathaway's fine, but I don't even, like, I don't even care about Chris Statlander anymore. And she was the one that ended Jade's undefeated streak, and now she's so far down the card like, I just worry whenever they build these girls up, start building them up, build them up, and then, you know, they get a title match and lose, and then they, it seems like they aren't that relevant anymore. We'll see. I'm gonna give that one a C plus. And I do think one more thing on that. I was thinking that, you know, we could have set up a storyline where May could have cost Storm the belt, then you put over Perrazzo, but... If you are bringing Banks in and bringing her right in that title picture, I don't think it needs to be against Perazzo. That's just not that big a, 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 you know, of a match. And I think it was probably a little too early on in this storyline with Mariah May helping out Tony Storm. You know, as much as I thought that might happen, I could see definitely a little early. And, you know, they can go two, three, four more months probably with May helping her out. You know, let May keep training, getting better. Maybe it takes her another five or six months, and then eventually I think we'll have them split and, and fight each other. But uh, overall, not bad. Just in a tough spot for those ladies. C+. All right. Before that, it was the Blackpool Combat Club taking on FTR. And I'm going to... Stay out of kayfabe, but then I'm going to go back into kayfabe here in a moment. And first, um, the non-kayfabe Gary says that it was a great paying homage by Mox and by Claudio coming out in the Road Warrior spiked shoulder pads through the crowd. Guess of what those guys did. A lot of matches in Greensboro, in the Coliseum, for many, many years. And they were paying their respects, doing all that stuff. Hup! Kayfabe's Gary here. I hate the Blackpool Pop Combat Club. Why? They're disrespecting the Road Warriors coming out there wearing the spiked shoulders. Get off my TV, John Moxley. You're the least... You are the weakest link from the shield. Garbage. Romans. The undisputed champion. Says the world heavyweight champion. What are you? 
John Moxley. You're in a tag team match against FTR in the middle of the card on the B show, the B brand. Get off my TV. Okay, I'm back. This is non K Fabe Gary coming back. Um, just joking around, but I, how about, ah, ah, I'm just not a Blackpool Combat Club fan. It was a fine match. I think FTR is great. Um, and the match was all right. Certainly solid, B minus. But, mm, ah, oh, I'm, oh, I'm jumping in and out of kayfabe, kayfabe, non kayfabe, kayfabe, non kayfabe. Moxley kicking out of an assisted, I think it was a middle rope, assisted pile driver. Spike pile driver onto his head. I said it before. Nobody should ever be kicking out of pile drivers. Very, 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 very rarely if you're the main event on WrestleMania or whatever, maybe even any pay-per-view. If Sting would have kicked out of it, I wouldn't have cared. But Sting's got that otherworldly figure like I was talking about. John Moxley does not. And if he wasn't already one of the worst sellers in the business, I, and maybe it's just me, and it's just the way that he sells. It's just not my style. And the way he hawks up, I just, I just don't believe him. He's just a guy that I don't believe. Whenever he's kicking out of stuff, I mean, I know that's not supposed to be the finish, so of course he's going to be kicking out of it. I just think they got to book it better. He shouldn't be kicking out of stuff like that. At worst, the ref should realize the foot's under the rope or something like that, or somebody dives in. There's so many other ways you can have that not be the finish and not have him have to kick out of a freaking pile driver, man. Drives me nuts. And he just don't, he don't sell stuff. He'll just go from one move to the other. Just like I was talking about Will Ospreay doing a great job of that, I feel like. And John Moxley, not so much sometime. And I just, whenever he's coming up and he's staggering, I don't know. To me, he's just not a very, he's just not a very good out. He needs to work on that. He needs to work on that. I just don't think he's, his acting skills and his selling skills just aren't very good. And he's one of those guys that whenever, He's on. He's laying there. He takes the shatter machine, I think it was, from FTR. And you could clearly see he's like looking over. He's like looking with eyes wide open. Like he's not even been hit at all tonight. Eyes wide open. Glancing over, waiting for Claudio to come make the save. I mean, I get it. you got to be able to see. Because if he's going to be late, you got to be able to get that shoulder up. I get it. But you just he doesn't make me believe him. Whenever that was, whenever that was happening, I just, I didn't believe it. I'm just not a big Moxley fan. I respect him absolutely for putting his body on the line. I know a lot of people love him, and that's fine. I, I get that. I understand that. We all like who we like and don't like who we don't like for different reasons, and those are the reasons that I just, I don't like Moxley. Um, so, so my care level of this match was. It was okay. I'm, I'm just not a big Claudio fan either. I know you've probably heard me say it before, but they're a combat club. But we got we got him out there doing the swing. Like, it just doesn't match up. I mean, cool. Moxley came in, and, and we've seen it a few times where he came in, and, and he kicked the guy while they're doing the swing. So that's all right. Um, you know, Moxley's not the worst wrestler in the world, but I don't know. Just not a fan of him. But I give this match a, a B. Minus, uh, I don't need to see it anymore. I think that Blackpool Combat Club, FTR, feuded long enough now. Move on. Let's do something else. And we will move on now to Roddy winning the International Championship over Orange Cassidy. I didn't want to see it. But I knew it was probably coming because we got to give Undisputed Kingdom something. I mean, I know what well, Taven and Bennett or whoever... They're uh, Ring of Honor tag team champions or six man or something. I'm sorry, just Ring of Honor. That, that means nothing to me. It, it just doesn't. If you're not an AEW, some kind of AEW champion, there's already a million of those belts. Like if you're Ring of Honor, any kind of Ring of Honor champion, it, it, it just means. Eh, it, so, 
So they needed they needed to get an AEW championship on one of their members. Wardlow won his match. We're going to talk about briefly here in a bit. So yeah, they need to build the Undisputed Kingdom up. Well, that's, that was a how big was that storyline for such a long, long time? Uh, who's under this devil mask? And then since then, you know, what have we really done? It it hurts with Adam Cole being hurt and still coming out there in damn wheelchair or crutches or whatever he's on now. It just, uh, it's it's a bad look. It's a bad look. He needs to heal up and get back in there. Or at worst, be on, on crutches, you know, get him out of the dang wheelchair. I don't know where he's at in his recovery, but anytime I see him out there, you know, in a wheelchair talking about, you know, all this stuff and giving these promos, like, I, I really can't believe you because you're hurt and you couldn't beat up anybody right now. So go fluff yourself. Undisputed Kingdom, been down. So I think it makes sense, Roddy winning this, but I do love Pockets a lot, Orange Cassidy a lot, sure do. I mean, he had 31 title defenses and 12 on his second run, between his first and his second run, so that's what, 43 title, 40 or 50 uh, title defenses combined between his two runs with that international championship absolutely incredible you know with uh who was it i think well, mox won it and somebody else got hurt or something like that so they ended up having to give it back to orange cassidy for a second run it had just like after he got done with that first run and then he does a, does another one and another several defenses like wow i love it hopefully they'll keep him relevant and doesn't fall back down the cards but he probably needs some time off Orange Cassidy wrestling his butt off over and over and over. I'm give that match a B. O'Reilly coming back definitely helped push it up there. Boy, he looked like he was tired or hung over or just getting old. I don't know. I ain't seen him in a while. I don't know. Like flashing in my head. I see him. I'm, I'm thinking about the old NXT days. Like how young he looked in, and uh, time's just flying these days. It really is. It doesn't seem like that was very long ago, and now here we are. And O'Reilly's backed out there. But, you know, look aside to him being back uh, and and giving the hug but and the handshake and stuff, but then not taking the shirt. Like saying, basically, I, I love you guys, but, you know, I don't want to be a part of this. But, well, why, I mean, I don't know. Why even, why even show up in the first place? And like they didn't know you were there, like you ain't been hanging out or anything. Like, hey guys, I'm gonna surprise you. I'm gonna surprise you after Roddy. I mean, I guess that makes sense. After Roddy wins the belt, gonna surprise you and congratulate you. And it does build the intrigue with not taking the shirt. I think everybody was probably expecting him maybe to, to turn on him, but then he would have put himself in a one-on-three situation. So even if a lot of people were expecting that, that wouldn't have made any sense if O'Reilly would have done that. But maybe we booked this out over several weeks and like, hey man, what do you mean you love us but you don't want to be in the group? Well, why not? Why don't you want to be with us, O'Reilly? Like, so, I like that being back. It'd be nice to get Bobby Fish back, get them all in there, get Wardlow out of this damn thing, let him actually have a legit singles run, uh, get him out of there by having, if he wins the title and then Adam Cole gets healthy and then Adam Cole says, hey, I'm healthy now, I need you to, I need you to do what you said you were going to do. And hand me that belt over. You talk about long-term uh, storytelling and threading story, different storylines together. It would make sense. So we'll see what happens. But yeah, Roddy, see what he can do with that international championship. Give that match a B. And the eight-man scramble wasn't a fan of it. I'm going to give it a C-. minus. Um, yes, Wardlow winning it. Makes the absolute most sense, but you get a lot of guys involved here, and only one of them's taken the pin. So we should have seen a whole hell of a lot of more saves, shouldn't we? But we saw a ton of kickouts in this match. We should have seen guys getting thrown on top of other guys making the pin, everybody doing anything they can to stop. That person from getting pinned, and then they can try to make a pin, and then somebody else hits them. There were way too many kickouts and way too many mistakes in this matchup. God bless Dante Martin, but Bot 
Retromania for old Dante out there. He botched two or three spots, and he does some crazy stuff, and you're not going to get him right all the time. And unfortunately, he had an off night uh, with his botches, and just too many guys standing around. I mean, at least do something. Lay on the ground or roll around or act like you're wincing in pain, but and maybe that's the camera guy's fault, you know, by just showing everybody just leaning, just out there. Sitting on the rope, just kind of are out, out on the outside ring apron, just kind of chilling there, looking, waiting for their spot. And you could tell, and it just wasn't believable that they had taken enough punishment to be out there on the outside hurt. I did, I did like, sort of, even though uh, early on with the, you had all the big guys in there, the meat match. Like, I, yeah, I, I, that's what I, I didn't know even what this was going to be. I knew it was, they were saying, the announcer said some kind of meat match or something. Well, you had the meat, meat guys and then the, the mini meat guys uh, doing a spot, you know, where they're all four in the ring. First, the big guys, second, the small guys. The big guys wasn't bad. Uh, and the crowd was chanting meat, I think, every time they hit him, you know, meat, meat, meat. And it was kind of funny, kind of cool. Uh, but, but also at the same time, I'm thinking, really, this is so choreographed and just kind of stupid and it doesn't even look like they're hardly hitting each other. And then and whenever the little guys got up and did the exact dang thing, same thing after that, I'm just like, no, no, was not a fan of it. And it was just clunky. It was just clunky all around this entire matchup, but good on them for letting uh, Wardlow win it. C minus. It was boy. It would have been a D plus for me if if they wouldn't have if they would have booked it wrong. It might have been an F if Wardlow wouldn't have won. But him getting the win, him looking pretty decent in it. Uh, I'm gonna give. That's why it ends up getting into the C minus range. The second match. We got two matches to go here. Working our way backwards on the card. The uh, second match of the night, though was Eddie Kingston with the power slam on Brian Danielson retaining his uh what is it continental crown new japan strong crown and ring of honor world championship did i get him right ding 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 i think i did anyways uh fine good match b minus match Brian Danielson and him give good match not really Brian Danielson fan as you know i got a lot of uh, kayfabe hate for the uh, Blackpool Combat Club, and I just never really was a big Daniel Bryan fan back in the day. Respected the Yes Movement, absolutely, but it didn't really titillate my juices or get my rocks off too much. So uh, him coming over to AEW, and I always give people a second chance, you know, to impress me. There's been plenty of guys that I didn't like, and then I turn out loving them. Uh, uh, Brian Danielson. I mean, I like his entrance music. I like the greatness song. I try to make that, you know, I, I, I jam out to that song quite a lot, quite a lot, and try to really embrace that and uh, see that for myself as well. So I do like his entrance music. Does that give me any brownie points? <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, it, it, Chop Fest City, and I'm not a big I, Chop Fest. Every now and then can be done decently. But you don't, we don't need to see him over and over and over. And we've seen a lot of them in this match. But I will say this about, they were hitting them pretty damn hard. And they were making me believe. And I was going, oh. And Daniel Bryan's chest always gets so red. And if you're into that kind of stuff and seeing how red their chest can get, like, I get it. I get that. It's like, wow. Super red chest. They're hitting them hard. You're feeling it at home. I get it. I just think that. They're overdone sometimes, and the little baby chops where he's hitting them real quick after he hits them real hard, like uh, the crowd pops hard for that. Sure, uh, that's that's fine, but uh, but every time he does that to me, I just roll my eyes. I'm like, oh my god! And the worst thing is outside of the chops is whenever they do the freaking back scratch, whenever they get him up there, especially Moxley, another one doing the back scratch. I ate it. So garbage. So garbage, but the uh, the match was fine. Eddie Kingston, great to see him get the victory to beat a guy like Brian Danielson. He's definitely solidified himself now, but at the same time, you know, I, should I be believing that a guy like Eddie can beat Brian Danielson? And uh, I guess Mox and Claudio, uh, I think, yeah, they won, right? Yeah, them winning, uh, you know, 
you kind of 50 50 book the blackpool combat club tonight by having brian danielson lose but um no, i am happy we haven't seen will or yuda in a while i didn't think about that oh no now thoughts might become might become things oh boy. we don't want that to happen that's i'm thinking kayfabe here guy i just don't like will or yuda as a wrestler glad he's been off my tv thank you so much um yeah the 50 50 book the blackpool combat club tonight brian danielson eating that loss uh eddie's fine give that match a b minus a lot of people are saying that was a potential show stealer for match of the night you know but i think you got to definitely at least put it behind the tag team and then osprey's match for sure i there were other things that i like better on this card uh opening match wise did i like it better than the eddie kingston brian anderson match yeah, storyline wise i mean yeah but uh i'm not a huge daniel garcia fan either again i get it crowds popping for the dance they love it he's gotten pretty over um but now, now what do you do with him he's took the loss we'll see if they can keep him keep him relevant or does he go right back to getting booked uh, inconsistently i just think they missed the opportunity with him and uh you know he should have turned on jericho and been a wrestler you know and got away from this whole sports entertainment gimmick and i know you might be saying well hey he's doing he's sports entertaining and wrestling now and like i said the fans love it i i get it i get it i don't I don't. He's earned my respect with being halfway decent on the mic and pretty good in the ring. But yeah, no, that no, no way in hell he should have beat Christian. So I'm glad that Christian retained. I was dis biggest disappointment. I was hoping that uh, Copeland would have came out, could have got that story, you know, ramped up a little bit. I don't know if Rated R Superstar is hurt right now or if he's just kind of waiting around. I thought that he might come out and help. Uh, Garcia, if they continue to beat Garcia down, but instead we see Mother Wayne get up on the apron, then Nick Wayne get involved, and uh, Christian able to retain through cheating, and that was fine. At that point, we had one one interference, but like I said, more and more the card moved on. We get uh, uh, one or two more interferences, so that one was fine at the beginning. I just didn't think that it was a really great way to start off the show from a getting the crowd hot standpoint i think it would have been better to start it off with uh brian danielson and eddie kingston and then have that christian match because because you let the face win the first match get the crowd going put on a hell of a match this was more of a storyline type match yes garcia does some decent stuff in the ring but um you know christian is what he is at his age he's not Really bringing anything new and exciting. No new moves or exciting things to the table. It's all storyline. All getting heat on the mic for him. So I think that maybe they should have flip-flopped that around. But overall, as a whole, uh, this pay-per-view started out a little slow. But boy, oh boy, I think it got better as, better as the night went on. Maybe there was a couple times where we step back just a little bit but then we're right back crowds right back to being red hot um just sting's last match man was uh yeah it's definitely night i'm not gonna forget for a long long time i'm gonna give it an a a solid a for this uh pay-per-view i just think when you have a match of the year candidate in there and you have it being sting's last match this is all all about that sting is my number one wrestler of the night we're getting into my top five wrestlers of the night so we had match of the night i gave it a tie between the tag team and osprey and Takesta. my move of the night darby jumping off of the ladder through the glass onto the chairs and then my wrestler of the night gotta go to gotta go with sting man got to go with sting my number two wrestler of the night i'm gonna go with darby allen just for that spot and the punishment that he takes Number three, I have to go with Will Ospreay. And you could argue that he was number one because I think he is, like I said, the best rope to rope in the world. So the fact that he's number three on the list for wrestler of the night tells you something about how good 
that this uh, pay-per-view was. Other honorable mentions, I mean, I don't know if I can pick a number four spot, probably to Kesta or Roddy, you know, big night for Roddy. Uh, Samoa Joe retaining, it could be an honorable mention. Swerve had a hell of a match. Hangman paid with a full heel transition, but you know, if I already mentioned Wardlow, you know, getting that win. There's just uh, a lot of good stuff going on here tonight. And that's a EW Revolution recap. We're going to get on into the top 10 coming up. Don't forget to hit that thumbs up, like, follow, subscribe, all that good jazz. Yeah. We're on to our top 10 list. We're doing men's, women's, tag team, and factions. I'm going to try to move through it relatively quickly, but stop, give some few key points, maybe why a certain guy's here or not there in that spot down the list, up the list, breaking it down, break it down. Dun, 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 dun. Let's start with the men this time. I'm going to give some honorable mentions to the top 10. Bron Breaker, Jey Uso, Damian Priest, AJ Styles, Logan Paul, LA Knight, Kevin Owens, Carmelo Hayes, Sami Zayn, and Gunther are all guys that have a chance, if they weren't in the top 10 before, to make their way into the top 10. And yes, the top 10 is very indicative of what has happened recently. AW Revolution last night. So you're going to see a few of those guys maybe climb past those other guys just because this was a pay-per-view. This was a big deal. This was a chance for them to shine. So it's their biggest chance to try to climb up the rankings now. Yes, could they fall right back down the rankings if they don't do a good job in following up with them? And WWE does a better job in telling their storylines with some of these other guys on the way to WrestleMania? Yes, absolutely. Things fluctuate. Things change. And with that said, yes, you are going to see a lot of AEW love here, but I think it's deserved. I think number 10, I'm going with Darby Allen. That move, I'm not going to forget for a long, long time. And being in the main event of that pay-per-view, putting his body on the line, being Sting's tag team partner, going out on top, undefeated, and now Sting passing the torch to Darby. Darby, right now, for the moment, it might be a very short-lived stint there, yes. But he's in my top 10 at number 10, at number 9, even though he took the loss. And this guy's been in the top 10 very consistently now for the three weeks that I've officially been doing it. And for about the last month or two overall, he's been right there on the line, getting the huge push. Got Swerve Strickland. Number 8, I'm going with the Viper. Randy Orton, number seven. Man, I wanted to put him higher so, so bad. But with the storyline going on, with the main storyline in wrestling, with the bloodline and Cody and Seth, I, ah, I couldn't put him any higher. I think after WrestleMania, he's got a chance to get into the top five. And this is where I'm putting a whole lot of stock on the in-ring work. And hopefully, if they can tell me a good story, then I definitely think he's capable of getting into the top five. If not, he might borderline on number nine or number ten, but he's so damn good in the ring. I got number seven, Will Bach, God Osprey. Number six, The Rock, has fallen a couple of spots, one or two spots for The Rock, just because, I don't know, I wasn't feeling it the other night. Uh, he was repeating himself, calling... The people in Phoenix, crackheads, meth heads, and, you know, just repeating a lot of the same stuff and just the whole setup with, uh, and it's funny, yes, but like, I'm kind of like what Seth or what Cody was saying, you know, he's, Seth was on social media saying, oh, he just does repeat the same stuff over and over, and like, yeah, I'm kind of feeling that, like, at first I was, I don't know, I'm not going to get into this whole thing again. I know I ramble on a lot a lot about this whole storyline, and it's just, it's we're on a roller coaster ride. There's a lot of good, and there's a lot of bad going on, and I just didn't think it was great setting up this tag team match, you know, and The Rock giving the social media posts, and like, oh, the fans threw away, and he's blurring the lines between kayfabe and not kayfabe. Go fluff yourself, Rock. Like, no. 
You're like, garbage, man. Like, if you want to do that and you're not talking about the story and you're giving just some interview on the business, fine. But don't blur the damn line. Stick with kayfabe. Tell me a damn story on WWE television. And I guess that's why you can blur the lines because it was social media, but a whole shit ton of people see that. I wasn't even going to watch it just because I like to keep it WWE television. That's the story you're telling me. You need to do the best damn job you can do at telling me that story. And it's so up and down with this whole thing. I just think they could have still done Roman and Rock night one. We still could have had them. Maybe, who knows, they could swerve us again. We still could have had that. Now we got a damn tag team match that, need, that means nothing. Oh, if they banned from ringside... Oh, we'll leave you alone, Cody. You can have your one-on-one -on -one match. Why even give him the opportunity to have that match? So, I know I've talked about that before. So, I'll stop. But regardless, he's still the Rock. Even though he hasn't wrestled yet. Yes, am I going to keep continuing to tune in every damn time he's on TV? Absolutely. We're selling out building to building to building. I was looking at maybe going to Memphis. Down to Memphis for SmackDown. Well, it's basically sold out. And I'm not sitting in the nosebleeds for... 60 70 dollars being blinded by the dang light that they shine at you from above the ring on the video board going blind just so everybody can look good on tv i'm not doing it i'm not doing it no thank you 100 levels seats for me i don't even want to do ringside anymore unless i can get first maybe second row at, at, at most because we sat in the third row for uh, NXT Battleground, and it was all right, but you know you can't see the entrance ways. You can't. It's hard to see them doing the, the moves in the spots whenever they're outside the ring, around ringside. Hard to see. So set me up row five, row ten, even row twenty in the section one hundred levels up behind the ring, side the ring. Sign me up. But yeah, I know we're selling out. We're selling out everywhere. So I get it, and that's why The Rock is still in the top ten. He's at number six, number five. I got Drew McIntyre. Number four, I got Seth freaking Rollins. Number three, I got Roman Reigns. And number two, I got Cody Rhodes. Like, wait a minute. These guys have been one, two, three, four for the past few weeks. What are we doing here? Well, I'm sorry, but I'm doing it. And for one last time, yes, he's going to fall probably right out of it on Monday, depending on what kind of story they tell us on Raw. But I got Sting. I feel in the emotions. He's the one that I'm most attached to right now, and he's going bye bye, and he deserves that number one spot for at least this show. God bless you, Sting. Thank you, Sting. And by the way, one more point on that. Sucked. Cut it off in the middle of him talking, watching the pay per view. It's like. As good as that damn pay-per-view was at the end of the day, it's still AEW and they're going to screw something up. And it might have been Sting's fault, to be totally honest with you, if he's getting cued. And he got cued and he's like, yeah, there's like 10 seconds left. He wasn't paying attention. Like, is it going to hurt us to just keep rolling the damn footage? Go on for another 5 or 10 minutes? I'm like, what? They only have a certain amount of the time and agreement that they have for the pay-per-view? We're on a pay-per-view here. Go as long as you can. Like, are we going to lose money? Like, is that part of the contract? Where they can't go over a certain time? I don't think so, because AEW goes over time all the damn time on their show. So, I just keep rolling. Why did we go off the air in the middle of that? It did kind of hurt it just a hair. And I have to wait 30, 40, 50 minutes an hour to go watch the exclusive on the YouTube, AEW YouTube. And then you get to see what Sting said and having Tony Khan come out and... All the wrestlers come out. Uh, to me, I would have just went off the air without saying a damn word. It should have just been getting thank you, Sting. Thank you, Sting. Thank you, Sting. You know? Could have had Nate getting back in there. Steamboat, whoever, and Darby and everybody. You know, those, those people, the main... Steamboat didn't need to be in there, like I said, but had Darby and Flair hug him. I mean, I know you already had the moment in the ring with Flair covering him up, and that was absolutely beautiful. But at least have Sting and Darby and then them holding up the belts, maybe getting some more confetti and Sting and Darby hugging, and the announcer's not saying a mother trucking word. Shut the hell up. AEW's the worst about that with their commentary. Talking through people's entrances is supposed to be 
some of these injuries are special. They did they did a good job in stings. They let it play out. Didn't say anything, but a lot of times they don't. So I'm glad they did there. But Sting didn't. They didn't need to pick him. I think they should have waited to do that on Dynamite. Could have thank thing thank Sting on Dynamite, and then had had the uh, the crowd. If you want to do that afterwards and have Tony Khan them say some words, that's fine. Do it off the pay per view. And it could be an exclusive, but keeping with uh, the a on my AEW television story, um, then you could have had Sting come out and, and uh, give a farewell speech and then have all the wrestlers come out of the ring just like we've seen with Ric Flair whenever he did it that next night on Monday Night Raw. That's what we saw with him. Maybe that still happens, possibly, because they did go off the air. But we saw Sting tap. Maybe Sting just picked up the microphone too quick. But he went on for like two, three, four minutes, I think. But anyways... He's number one. Moving on to the ladies at number 10. And this list, man, I, I, we need to build these ladies back up. I do hope Monet comes. She could be a top five, top 10 candidate. You know, get Britt Baker, Jamie Hayter back at some point. Um, really help the women's top 10. Um, they just, uh, I don't know, it's decent, but it's not great. It's not great. And at number 10, I got Liv Morgan. At number 9, I got Jade Cargill. Again, I know she hasn't wrestled, but she's got that star factor, that it factor. And I'm hoping to see her on my TV. I want to know what's happening with her. Number 8, I got EO Sky. Number 7, Nia Jax slipped in a couple spots after her big match against Rhea. She's falling to number 7, and Tiffany Stratton jumped in front of her. Just uh, Tiffany's on the rise. She's on the rise. Sign me up. At number 5, I got Bianca Belair. Number 4, I got Becky. Number three, I got Tony Storm. She had a chance, you know, if this would have been like an A plus match or an A match somehow, she had a chance to leapfrog Bailey. Definitely not Rhea Ripley. She had a chance to leapfrog Bailey at least for a few days, but it didn't happen. It was decent, but Tony Storm's still at number three, and obviously number one, we got Rhea Bloody Ripley, my Rhea Bloody Ripley. And we're going to move on to the tag team number 10. I'm going to show the Blackpool Combat some love. I'm not going to be totally biased because they are making them, it looks like, into a tag team uh, for sure. They've been having a lot of matches. An official tag team. Maybe they go after the goal. I got Mox and Claudio at number 10. Number 9, I got Imperium. Number 8, uh, Kabuki Warriors, WWE Women's Tag Team Champions. I think that tells you just, you know, you got champions. You got him at number eight, and I got the EO at number eight. And I tell you, I love damage control, and you're going to see they're in the top faction. So I'm like, I know it might not be making a lot of sense and what's going on here, but you just got other people ahead of them that are better, I think. Number seven, I got New Day. Number six, I got New Catch Republic. What a match they had. What a match they had at Elimination Chamber coming up short, but they had a hell of a match. Number five, I'm going to throw FTR in there. That was a heck of a match against Mox and Claudio, despite me being a Blackpool Combat Club hater. I do uh, absolutely respect FTR. They're not one of my favorites, but I do like them very much. At times, they can really win me over, and that was solid. So they've done a nice job jumping back in. I don't think they were in the uh, top 10 before my tag teams. This is my first official tag team rankings. Number four, I got Baron Corber, Braun Breaker. Number three, I'm going with Balor and Priest. They might be right back up to number one. I've been doing the tag team, even though I haven't posted it for a while, and Judgment Day's been at the top with Balor and Priest, but not right now. Not at this moment in time. And they haven't been, even before this, because I've been eating up every single minute, second of this Sting and Darby and the Young Bucks storyline leading to Sting's last match. That's why the Young Bucks, and give them a lot of credit. What do they do now with them guys, you know? I mean, because they, yeah, sure, they could say they got screwed over because Sting's kids were out there helping. They could tell that story or they could just use their power now to, I don't know, make the, make strip them of the belts. They're going to need to be stripped anyways. They're like, they're going to have something to do with this whole tag team and what goes, moves forward. Definitely. They're the EVPs. Like they should be making the decision. They should be screwing some people over, you know, maybe, uh, maybe they have a tournament and it's like they get not only one buy, but they get two buys. Like, oh, we're straight into the finals of the tournament, you know? Or maybe they just get, they, like I said, maybe they just get another tag team partner for Darby. Somebody really popping, and then they can go up against the, the Young Bucks again or send Darby out on a singles run. Like I said, we'll see. But number one, I got Sting and Darby. God bless. If you 
were making me choose between one and the other. I mean, I would choose match of the night. The, it's weird. All right, hear me out. It's going to sound not logical, but my match of the night, the other night, definitely the tag team match from the storyline and from all the moves and everything going on. That was my match of the night, but my match of the year might be Will Ospreay and Takesta so far. I know that doesn't make sense, but I think match of the year, you're talking more of a rope-to-rope -rope type deal, and you don't think about the storyline necessarily. If you do, but you don't. I don't know. May not make any sense, but it may. Oh well, who cares? Moving on. Top five. Eh, we'll go top ten factions. Just give the BCC a little more love. I got them at ten. And this is really, I, I haven't I had this going on for a while, and this is a really kind of tough to gauge who's who's hotter right now, who's more watchable, who's got the better storylines. You know, you got so many people in different factions, you know, who's got the most wrestlers, who's getting the most TV time out of that, who's got the most wrestlers wrestling matches, and is everybody wrestling, is everybody not wrestling, so many different things. So it's been a hard one to kind of compile together. So you may agree or disagree. Number nine, I got Legato del Fantasma. Number eight, I got the LWO. Number seven, I got Imperius. Number six, I wanted to put him a little higher. I'm just a little bit invested uh, in some other guys more, but I think Don Cal's family right now, with him having internal fighting going on, has been pretty darn good. Number five, I got the Undisputed Kingdom. Big win, like I said, for Roddy, with O'Reilly getting back in the mix. Maybe he's in, maybe he's out. Can we ever get Adam Cole healthy? Wardlow getting a big win. I think Undisputed Kingdom, they were kind of falling down by the wayside. They were right up top two, top three, whenever... The they just came out and reeled the mask that was Cole under there. They were they were maybe one or two spots higher, but uh, then they fall. They fell to like number 10 or so, or even maybe out of the top 10 at one point, but I got them at number five right now. Number four, I got the Patriarchy. I'm just a, uh, man, I, I just, I, I probably should switch that. All right, I'll switch it around. Number five, I'm going to go Patriarchy. Number four, I'm going to go Undisputed Kingdom. I do like everything going on with the Patriarchy. I love me some Mama Wayne. She'd be smoking. Woo! Mama Wayne be hot. Yeah. Woo, woo, woo. I like it. Um, I, I, I do. I like I like everything to do with her. I think she she looks, I don't know if she was ever involved before with, uh, you know, being like a valet or anything like that, but she, she looks like she's she does great. She does a great job on TV. She's got the pleasing aesthetics and you know, just the whole storyline. I like it. Like I said, this is sound crazy, and they haven't done it yet, but they if her and Christian ever made out, oh, my. Yeah, you talk about a viral moment. <laughs> oh, shit. Uh, number. What do we got? What do we need? What do we got? Getting towards the end of this thing here. I'm getting a little slap happy. Number three, I got damage control. Again, it's been up and down for me on this, but I, I think they've done a nice job as a whole. I uh, hope Bailey wins at Mania. Number two, I got the Judgment Day. Number one, I got the Bloodline. Number, number, Judgment Day was ahead of the Bloodline for quite a long time there, but The Rock being back and this just being the hottest story in wrestling, that's why they're number one. And that is the end. We have come to the end. Showtime is over for this time. I am Gary. Thank you for tuning in to the Top Rope Podcast. God bless. That's Larry Zabisco, by the way, guys. I always do that. I love doing that. God bless. See you next time.